It's California edition coming to you from Sacramento. We are joined by Rocky Chavez. He's a member of the California State Assembly. He represents North San Diego County. And of course, that area has been impacted by the closure of San Onofre. I can't believe I'm saying those words. I knew there were problems when the plant shut down in January 2012, but the iconic San Onofre is closing. That's right. It's been there forever, hasn't it? Literally. I mean, those the <laughs> iconic humps as you <laughs> drive up and down the five. I want to talk to you, though, about your constituents. There's no doubt, I think, a thousand people work for San Onofre. We can put aside the safety issue for now, but what about your constituents, those people who work at San Onofre? It's a huge impact upon jobs. Uh, so right now, it's predicted between 1,000 and 1,300 jobs mm -hmm. will be lost. And those jobs are in Oceanside, Vista, Carlsbad, and some in San Clemente. Mm -hmm. So it's a big economic impact for jobs to the region. So are you able to start working with San Onofre on outplacement or is the closure going to take so long that really we're far off from when we have to do outplacement services? Actually they're doing it right now. It's my understanding talking to uh, Edison that initially uh, you're looking at about a thousand jobs in the first year. Mm. And then the closure portion that you just identified is going to be a lo much longer process because you're dealing with nuclear fuel rods and the, and the movement of those. So. And I want to ask you about that closure because it would seem to me there are a lot of different agencies involved. You have the Department of Defense because I believe that San Onofre is on Camp Pendleton. But then I would think the California Coastal Commission would be involved. And then would San Diego, San Diego County be involved or the state? I, I can't even imagine. Well, you're, you're right that Camp Pendleton will be involved, but probably the biggest player is going to be the National Regulatory Agency. NRC, of course. NRC. Right. Um, there's going to, obviously, Edison's going to be involved. Uh, there's going to be a lot of issues on, um, on the who's going to pay for it. Right. Because it was planned that the San Onofre would be there f for some years. What, am, what about Mitsubishi? <laughs> Mitsubishi. The, the entity who allegedly <laughs> provided the faulty rods. But I met some people the other day, uh, and they were saying that if we would, if they had allowed the opportunity to go forward, they think they probably could have uh, kept sent on free operational. Right. But because of the political outfall and the risk, because it's a huge investment and there's a lot of risk to it, they chose to take the business decision and take San Onofre down. So what about the Coastal Commission? We know how much power that they wield in the state. Will they be involved? Not so much in taking it down, but they may be involved in your, and this is the question that needs to be asked is, once San Onofre is gone, are there opportunities for another uh, power source there? Sure. Because you already have the transmission lines there. You already have a site that's been identified uh, do we want to do something else? And you mentioned power, mm -hmm. and there's no doubt that San Onofre provided a tremendous amount of power to the state, let alone San Diego County. What's going to happen? How do we replace that power? I think it provided power for 1.4 million homes, not people, homes. I mean, multiply that out, it's significant. San Onofre provided power for Orange County, Southern LA, and San Diego. Right. <clears throat> and when, now that it's gone, we're going to have a huge economic impact upon the uh, residents. Yesterday, while I was at utilities hearing, at 3.06, the uh, meeting started at 3, mm -hmm. I get a little email from San Diego Gas and Electric telling me my rates are going to go up. I want to ask you about that because I found that email fascinating. Um, one could argue the email was filled with a bit of forgive me, doublespeak or oxymorons in terms of how Edison was going to move forward in terms of ratepayer expenses and cost to ratepayers. So when we come back, let's talk about the impact to the consumers, the electricity consumers uh, that will still be served by Edison. We're speaking with Rocky Chavez. For our viewers on HLN, we thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So, Assemblymember, I saw the email that you referenced, and it indicated that the cost of producing and delivering the renewable energy will all, we all desire is more expensive than traditional sources. Renewable means you can use it again. So why is it more expensive than traditional sources, which you cannot use again? Because those uh, renewables are, are solar and they're wind and they're thermal. And they are renewable in the sense that, you know, the sun continues to shine or the wind continues to blow, but they're only for a periodic, uh, uh, it's very specific time when the sun's up or the wind's blowing. Right. 
when you look at the power system that we have, uh, when you produce power, it has to be used. You can't store it. Well, solar you can store, no? You can, if you, if you decide to use batteries and put in the batteries, it's an extremely expensive cost because now you have to pay for the battery, pay for the, uh, the storing of the battery, and then when you use the power from the battery, then you look at the cost to get rid of the battery because there's a cost for uh, getting rid of the battery. It's more expensive to do it that way than pay for that. But for I have a one sense time. that as we march through the 21st century, that the cost for renewables was dropping through economies <coughs> of scale. A a am I off base? You're off base. The, uh, there's a very good graph, there's a group called the ISO, and what they do is they control the amount of power in the transmission lines for the state of California. And you need to have what they call a common load. If the load goes too low, the system shuts down. If it goes too high, it stresses the system. So their job is to keep it stable. Solar provides power sometime, and then when the sun goes down, it's gone. Well, that load factor is gone. But if you have to maintain a status, so how do you do that? That's where San Onofre came in because it churned out power 24 hours a day. What about Diablo? Can it pick up some of the slack? Well, Diablo's picking it up, but those are peaker plants. Those are originally designed to come online when solar would come, go down, they would come on to fill that requirement. Now with San Onofre down, all the plants that we have currently scoped out there are going to be required to be on to maintain the grid system. I also want to ask you about the email and the portion which says, if you paid $100 a month, the increase would be $15. So that's 15%. If you paid $250 a month, the increase would be $75. Well, I think that's 30%. I would have thought the more that your bill is, again, back to economies of the scale, the increase would go down. Why is it going up as your bill gets more expensive? Because the way the Public Utility Commission has, has structured the pay system in the state of California, that we charge, um, if you make more money assuming that you use more power, then you have the ability to pay a higher fee. So it's tiered. The lower the use, uh, the lower the amount of money you pay, the, assuming that you don't, you had a limited income. Let me ask you, though, about the need to increase rates as described by Edison. We know that something went terribly wrong with the rejiggering of San Onofre two or three years ago through the efforts of Mitsubishi. Could Edison not turn to Mitsubishi or its insurer as a way to try to avoid these really steep hikes I mean, the rate payers are really getting, you know, they've pulled the wrong straw as it relates to this disaster. Why, does, why is it always the rate payers that have to p pick up the slack? And that's actually the role of the Public Utilities Commission to oversee to protect the rate payers. Yesterday on a commission, that issue was brought up. But Edison is a business, and they had to make a decision. Were they to go ahead and continue to invest in San Onofre? When you have Senator Boxer attacking it, and there's all this fear being spread about, you know, nuclear power. And there's a group of people in California who don't, do not like nuclear power. Well, it's interesting. I mean... So it became a political issue, not just an economic well, issue. Some would say nuclear is the new green. As long as there's no leak, it's very clean energy. So, you know, even the environmentalists seem to be confused about whether they like green or not. But again... Why is it that the ratepayers have to pick up the slack? I mean, Edison is regulated, I believe, by the PUC. Where's the PUC on this? Well, the PUC is overseeing what they're doing, but understanding by 2020, a third of all power in California is supposed to be renewable. Right. We're not near that. Right. So now you took down a, a significant is system. Is nuclear considered renewable? That was, con it wasn't. It wasn't considered renewable, but it was part of that, that uh, power source that we had there. I understand. Now you took them off, and now we have to provide more power, and they're, they're looking at Edison. i got to get to a 33% rate of okay. renewable. How do I get there? It's more expensive mm. than a peaker plant. His name is Rocky Chavez, member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Palmer. It's this is California Edition.
It's California Edition coming to you from Sacramento. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Kacho Ashajian, he's a member of the California State Assembly. And so I want to speak with you about the recent budget negotiations. This was the first year where the Democrats had a supermajority and arguably would not need Republican votes. But my sense is Republicans were somewhat engaged. Am I right or am I off base? We were engaged, needless to say, on an individual basis, not necessarily as a party or minority party. Mm -hmm. But overall, it was a good year to be dealt with the budget because right. if you compare it two and a half years ago when I first came into the picture and we were dealing with a $26 billion deficit, right. the year after that was a little better. We were dealing with $16 billion deficit and now no deficit, so to say, as far as the budget right. goes. It was it was a good time. But I want to get a sense from you because I've read articles, I've heard discussions which suggest that the Democratic governor is aligning himself with the Republicans in the legislature to push fiscal prudence. Is that what you feel? I feel like he wants to bring discipline across the border. And when you hear that there's an agreement the budget to go forward. It's right. usually between the left and the far left. <laughs> so <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> so the governor has, has uh, brought forward, I think, uh, a, a new character, a new Democrat, a new reformer who wants to make it right and not be spoiled by these additional revenues that right. are coming in and not to overspend what's here, even though I think, in my own opinion, there are places he could have done better. Right. But that, overall, done a great job. That being said, we know that in 2004, a rainy day fund was set up. Mm -hmm. Money's put, put in twice, it's been emptied twice. This year, there was about a billion dollars set aside in reserves, but not put in the rainy day fund. It's a little unclear as to why that distinction has been made. What's your sense? My sense is that's one of the failures of this budget that moved forward, that we weren't able to put the sunshine money for rainy days aside and the, the dollar amount that the, the government promised to put aside. Why? For the reasons that they want to give more money to schools, which I supported. Right. They end up giving more money to our courts. Another $62 million right. went to our courts. It's not backlog issues. A lot of money went to to the different departments that had a backlog. But what's the difference between putting money in reserve or simply putting it into the rainy day fund? Is it it's easily accessible if it's in reserve? Exactly, it's just to play up words. I want to talk to you about the local control funding formula. That is a revolution in the way we fund education. It gives more money to school districts which educate foster children, English mm -hmm. language learners, and those that are economically disadvantaged. It really is quite a sea change. What's your sense of this? It's something I preach early on that I'm here to empower local decision makers mm -hmm. because they know how, how it fits best to their local communities, what's needed in, in their backyards, and giving money to schools and force them to spend as we did in the past. It, it was a killer of a deal. Now that they have the money and they can decide where to spend, how to spend, hopefully the needs are in the classroom and that's where they focus to spend the money right. is going to be put to best use. There's no doubt that local districts are getting more discretion through this formula, but what about the element of giving more money to districts which educate more challenged students? Well, I'm all in favor of that for the reasons that if all schools get the right, the, the correct dollar amount of money equally distributed, but give a little extra to those schools who have the challenge of educating school students who English is a second language and or areas that you have people with, with less or more of a disability to learn and be mm -hmm. educated, they need help. Okay, when we come back, I wanna speak with you about healthcare reform. We're speaking with Kacho Ashajian, member of the California State Assembly. For our viewers on HLN, thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So I want to continue our conversation and speak about health care reform, also known as the Affordable Care Act, also known yes. as Obamacare, whatever you want to call it. But what we do know is that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the federal government could not require states to expand Medicaid or Medi-Cal in our case. California has chosen to accept the federal funding to expand its Medi-Cal uh, funding formula. It went to the legislature, and there was one Republican who supported that expansion, and I am looking at him. What made you decide to make that leap? It was not simple, but 
in other words, it was the right thing to do. I did not support Obamacare. I did not support that where individuals would be forced into this health care system. But once the affordable health care became the law of the land, then I gave myself no choice but to support it because those of our members of the state who make 15,000, a little over 15,000 and less to be qualified into this program. Otherwise, that cost is much bigger for us because they wait, they cannot afford health care. They wait till they need to be taken to an emergency room and you and I are paying for it. On the other hand, let me also Please. explain this, this. With accepting this extension, federal government will be paying 100% of the cost for the next three years and past that th third year, the cost to us is only 10%. And as I understand it, under the governor's budget relating to this issue, mm -hmm. there's a provision which says if the federal government ever tries to drop below 70%, California will pull we out. We have the choice to pull out. And that's to me, was the green light as why I supported it. There was no other way to look at how I can bring this help to the folks who can afford otherwise. Sir, this is not the only time you have been one Republican supporting a, quote, Democratic bill. There have been other instances with regard to the Memorandum of Understanding a few years mm -hmm. ago dealing with labor, with regard to other issues that have come before the legislature. How is that for you? Let me take you back two and a half years where Please. I supported the MOU. Without a contract, status quo was costing us $500 million. And when the MOU came to us, we were saving $280 million out of the $500 million that was costing. And to me, that was a good step forward. If we walked away to say, all or nothing, why should the unions ever come back to the table to have any discussion but with us? what I'm wondering is, mm -hmm. we know that political parties are very keen on discipline. They want their members to vote how they want them to vote. And you have managed to, in a few instances, buck that party Yet we don't see a lot of retribution. Your voters still seem to support you. How are you able to do it? And yet other Republicans will be literally chastised and put out to pasture. The reasons are that my discipline came from my parents. Oh first. my. <laughs> Two, I'm here to serve my district as what's best for my district. Right. Third, when I look at a bill, if it's a good bill, doesn't matter what the source it comes from, I'm gonna support it for the good of the Californians. So let's talk about your district. It's a tough living in San Luis Obispo <laughs> County, I am sure. It's difficult in paradise. What are your voters, your constituents talking to you about? Are they talking about health care reform? What's on their minds? Not necessarily. What on their mind is time after time, it's still the economy, it's still right. the jobs, and those are big issues. If you go to very local issues, we have water issues, growth issues, and everything else that comes, also healthcare issues. But overall, still the economy, still jobs. I want to ask you about Diablo Canyon. Yes. And the reason I ask you about that, I was recently speaking with Rocky Chavez, one of your friends. He represents San Onofre's uh -huh. nuclear power plant, or what was San Onofre's nuclear power plant. You represent what still is Diablo Canyon's nuclear power plant. Are there efforts um, through Diablo to try to increase capacity since San Onofre is now being shut down? Let me first uh, welcome uh, Rocky. He's been a yes. good asset to our organizations. Mm. Diablo Canyon is there to stay. And I've been working with Diablo Canyon as a county member of the right. County Board of Supervisors and as a Coastal Commission because anything we do, it has to go to the Coastal right. Commission for approval. We approved it generators that we're getting all at the new generators. Now it's going through the process of renewing its yes. permit. And I hope they get it because it's a must, Not, especially that Santa Fe is out of the picture. We're 10% of California is dependent on the Abel Canyon. Right. They've done an excellent job to make it safer, better for all concerned. Will Diablo be trying to increase capacity because San Onofre is offline, do you know? I think by choice they need to, right. just to be on the safe side, and this is the right time to ask for that increase capability, right. and it's also right time to ask for to be able to recycle their nuclear waste, okay. because in, in the past they did not have that right. Hopefully within this process, that's all, also part of the project. He's Kacho Shaji, a member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Palmer, it's this is California Edition.
California edition coming to you from Sacramento. We are joined by Dan Logue. He's a member of the California State Assembly. And sir, there was a, quite a controversy recently, a bit surprising, and came out of nowhere. And it dealt with California's Public Records Act. Yes. And as I understand it, the law had been that the state would reimburse localities for requests under the California Records Act. Yeah. And there was some legislation passed that would have changed that formula, and the state would no longer reimburse. You saw editorial boards up and down the state really unload yeah. on the legislature. Talk to me about this issue, it's fascinating. Well, it's really fascinating, it's, and it's an interesting point. I was the legislator who kind of lit the match and mm. sent out the uh, press release to all the press throughout the state. You. <laughs> yeah, and I thought it was uh, very important because the key component in, in government in America is transparency. Sure. That is the kind of the, the uh, safety net, so to speak, when you have uh, governments basically uh, doing business behind closed doors. The people pay the taxes, we represent the people, uh, we work for the people. And to almost bar them from being, being able to get these records, I think is unconscionable. But I want to really focus on the question because, as I understood it, it wasn't revoking their requirement that they provide the records, it was that the state would no longer reimburse localities. Well, not, qu not quite true. What uh, AB 71 actually did was it removed the mandate. Remove the mandate? Uh, in other Com words, you could comply or you did not have to comply. Right now, based upon law, you have 10 days to comply. There was no limit to the days that they could comply. They could actually go five years and not comply. And that is really great for cities like Bell. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yes, I we mean, all know about the Bell controversy. Yeah, millions and millions of dollars of corruption. And the Records Request Act, if, if it had passed it in its original form by uh, removing the mandate, uh, you know, many cities who really have something to hide were rejoicing in basically high-fiving and popping champagne bottles. But what was stunning about the legislation once it passed was the speed with which it was immediately reversed. Literally, what, what was yes. it, a week? Well, it was within, within a few days. Had the governor even signed it yet? No. And, and that's the key. This was driven by the governor and the Republic, I mean, and the Democratic Majority Assembly. And so when this thing hit our floor, we, the Republican Party, voted against it. Primarily, one of the reasons was because of that. So the key component here was when that happened, a lot of people in the majority side did not know it was even in there. So I sent out a press release right. to the entire state saying, this is in there, this has to be revoked, and I was going to do a bill in order to do that. What's interesting, though, is, of course, we want transparency. Yes. But we know there also are some folks that may abuse the Public Records Act. Correct. And border on harassing local governments. Yes. You know, they want every single email, they want every single voicemail. How do we create that balance so that local governments aren't bogged down by these requests? The, bar, the primary issue is this government is really there to serve the people. And the people are the ones who are in charge, you know. Right. I mean, our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence says we the people. And that's so that's the price of that's democracy? The price I mean, it, yes, yeah. that's a I good mean, point. It's a fair answer. And, 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 and it's not going to be perfect, and no government is perfect, but to have transparency. That, look, it's the nature of government to consolidate power. It's its nature to do that. And, and in, if you don't have transparency in government, it will continue to do that. So behavior. you pleased with the final result? You must be. I'm pretty excited because as the, I'm the first Republican to co-author the new bill by Leno and Mr. Levine. A Democrat. Absolutely, mm -hmm. as joint, um, I mean, as a, a co-author right. bipartisanship. When we come back, I want to continue this conversation and speak about the proposed constitutional amendment. Yes. His name is Dan Logue. For our viewers on HLN, thank you for joining us. For our other viewers, we'll be right back. So, sir, I want to continue our conversation about public records, and I understand that, as you had just mentioned, that you are co-authoring a bipartisan bill in the form of what's known as Senate Constitutional Amendment 3. Correct. What would that do? Well, what it would do is that the governor has agreed, by the way, to uh, allow for the reinstatement of the mandates on the Records Act, and that will be signed into law. But this will basically make it a constitutional amendment, and it will go before a vote of the people. So that means the legislature could not yes. do what it had done recently. Absolutely. But I do want to go back to this funding question. Yes. Why should 
the state have to reimburse the locals? Why couldn't the locals pay for it? It's my understanding that in the constitutional amendment that the, that the locals will pay for it. Ah, so there is some funding yes. shift. Yes, funding shift, absolutely. I mean, uh, the bottom line is, is, is I'd rather not have to have that transfer, but the bottom line is I'd rather have transparency than anything. It's the most important issue of all. I want to talk about funding yes. and focus on the budget that yes. was recently passed. Who would have thunk that in one year we would go from significant deficits to being in the black? Apparently we are. So how was it, sir, this year to be working on a budget where you weren't dealing with deficits? Well, it was one of the few times we haven't spent all night there, which no, is nice. Fair enough. Uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. Uh, there's a reason. That the concern that I have is that the governor borrowed $500 million from cap and trade and uh, at the cost of $28 million a year. I, that's something I did not agree with. Another issue is in the, the budget, uh, we had uh, AB 67, as I co-authored, which would have frozen tuition hikes for college students as long as uh, Prop 30 was in play. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the purpose of Prop 30 was passed, should bring in about $5 million, but we want to make sure that the students are going to benefit from that. And the Democrats in our majority party killed that part of the bill. I want to ask you, though, about what someone called fiscal prudence. As you know, in 2004, a rainy day fund correct. was created. Yes. Money was put in. Yes. It's been emptied. Yes, correct. In this budget, there was over a billion dollars put in reserve but not technically in the rainy day fund. Correct. What do you make of that? I believe that is concerning the issue of Prop 98, which is the funding for education. Uh, I okay. think there's a concern of whether or not the resources will be there. And that was set aside, and I believe that's also the reason why Governor Brown set aside a half a million billion dollars from the uh, cap and trade as a, on reserve as a loan from cap and trade. But should we be placing the money in the rainy day fund? I mean, that's the reason it was set up. I think that you hit it right on the, the nail on the head. That's how we get into trouble because we're not doing that. We wanted a spending cap and a rainy day fund both, and we didn't, we didn't get either. Along the same lines, I want to talk to you about pensions and retiree health care. Yes. As I understand it, the California state government has about $180 billion liability. $500 billion. Depending on what you add and what you don't yes. add. I mean, you can look at 100 million different figures, but it's a lot of money. It's yes. in the billions. Yes. And as I understand it, that issue is not addressed in this budget. The is that of concern? It's not addressed, and it's a major concern. And not only that, but now we still have the high-speed rail we're trying to get uh, get in place, which is $100 billion. And my concern is, is we have a half a trillion dollars in pension debt. We have $120 billion in bond debt. And, uh, well, we don't, aside from high-speed yes. rail, because I definitely want to talk to you about that sure. at some point, you do mention bond debt, yes. and I know that several bonds have been floated, yes. uh, yet we're not taking money out on them, and we're paying interest on them. Correct. You know, our indebtedness, some of it was paid down in this last budget, specifically yes. to education, Correct. but are we dealing with that un the underlying issue of California's debt? Uh, I don't think that we are. I think that we got a big bump. Remember, we are so-called so in the black, right. but a lot of those Look, the one of the big reason why we're in the black is because many of the people last year paid their taxes early and we got a big bomb. I don't think that's going to happen next year. It's interesting. Um, under the last administration, you saw the Republican governor aligning with the Democrats in the legislature. Correct. In this administration, it seems like maybe Governor Brown and the Republicans are lining up a bit on fiscal yeah. prudence. I, I think Governor Brown is probably the most conservative Democrat in Sacramento. How interesting. And, and that says a lot. He has, I like him. I think he's a man of his word. Uh, he's worked with me on timber harvesting plans right. and on job creation. Okay. So I have, you know, we, we get along pretty well, but hear. we disagree on many things. It's too. okay. His name is Dan Logue, member of the California State Assembly. I'm Brad Pomerantz. This is California Edition.